have a lot to live up to now, having been uh, having said that I'm going to give a, um, a fantastic uh, overview of uh, the mind of a machine, um, and whether machines indeed do have minds. What I'm going to do, and I feel hopelessly unqualified, really, to be to be talking to real teachers as opposed to uh, people like me who who give lectures and teach people at undergraduate level, which I'm married to a teacher, really is not the same kind of thing. Um, I do have one qualification, I did actually go to school, and I, I did come out of it with a love for lots of things. And I think that, uh, you know, that's one of the things that I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, as I go through this, not my love for various things, but the, the need for things like diversity, and how learning itself, at its very core, is driven by the unusual. So entrainment is pretty dull. So, because we, uh, we love our machines, uh, I decided to ask uh, my AI algorithm to write this talk for me, having told it what Simon would talk about. And uh, because he's just said machines uh, really can't do any of that, it just said, I'm sorry, Steve. I'm afraid I can't do that. And proceeded to give me a blue screen of death. However... We are in a world where people such as Google CEO Sundar Pichai will tell us that AI is more profound than electricity and fire in terms of a technological breakthrough. It's up there with everything that we think of as a key moment in human technological history. Things that transform the way we live and most importantly the way we act as a society. I think technology itself had a profound impact on what we are as a species. It changed us in fundamental ways. Yet the reality of AI is often a little bit uh, less clear. Uh, we can type, for example, into many well-known image analysis bits of software and say, AI engine, you know all about images. What is this? And it will tell us that it is a refrigerator filled with lots of food and drink. I'm not quite too sure why, possibly because there's a beer label up there. But machine learning and AI are a huge big business. And what I'm going to hope to give a little bit of an exposition of uh, over the next three quarters of an hour or an hour is to try and convince you that it is not just selling old rope. However, there is some caution required. These are uh, Gartner hype curves. Uh, whether we believe them or not, I'm, I'm always amused by the, the words, the peak of inflated expectations, the trough of disillusionment. This, it feels like my, my teenage years. Um, the slope of enlightenment. And at some point, I'm hoping to reach the plateau of productivity. I just point out machine learning and AI are at the peak of inflated expectations. Um, I personally don't believe that they are going to drop into the trough of disillusionment, along with such things as augmented reality. Um, many of us will remember with excitement a decade ago, uh, we could put on uh, some headgear and we could, we could be part of a virtual environment. There was sort of a, um, entire sites into which educational establishments kind of bought in to buy islands for their community so they could interact in a virtual world. Like so many things in life, it never really came to anything. It is in the trough of disillusionment and has gone nowhere. So there is something essential about that face-to-face -face interaction. And I think that is one of the first points that I would make, is that we communicate with one another in a very different way to communicating with a machine. And machines communicate with us in very different ways, as we do to one another. And machines, of course, communicate with one another in bizarre and weird ways, if they are allowed to. That means that as we begin to push AI further and further, there is a disparity between what is understandable at a human level and what is understandable at machine level in terms of its outcomes. I think it'd be worth saying, up front, one of the biggest things that's fueling machine learning is not some breakthrough in mathematics 
or computer science in the purest sense. We've known, in principle, really since the turn of the 20th century, what learning is mathematically, <coughs> in an information sense, how we accumulate knowledge and how we build a repertoire of that knowledge so that we can act upon it, upon it and we can choose options in order to maximise good consequences and minimise bad consequences. One of the things which has fueled AI and machine learning over the last decade is the enormous rise in the scale of data. All printed material, we sit as part of the, the wonderful Bodleian Library, a copyright library, that in principle holds a copy of everything that is published. All the printed material on the planet is tiny. All the words ever spoken by any human being, and we'll be very generous and say we as a species, have existed for somewhere in the region of 400 to half a million years. Every word that's ever been spoken, fairly tiny, in comparison with the volume just of internet traffic. This is declared volume. This is legal websites communicating with each other. This doesn't contain dark web. It doesn't contain anything to do with government or hidden sources. Does anybody know what the proportion of information that's out there on the accessible web is in comparison with what is dark to us? The visible is between 10 and 15 percent. So this traffic is potentially only 10 percent of the traffic. The theoretical limit of information that can be stored in one human brain is just over one zettabyte. That means that I absolutely cram my brain with perfect efficiency on the basis of the number of neurons that I've got. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, you know, order, order of stars in a galaxy. So zettabytes are pretty big numbers. And we are in this flood of data. I don't need to convince any of you that this exists at a scale beyond human, but not at a scale beyond machine. Algorithms themselves need a substrate to work on. And if we look at the speed, these are on a logarithmic scale over, over here. This is really Moore's law, where the speed of computation rises exponentially fast. And we can see every few years you end up with a doubling of the processing power. We live in a world, whether we like it or not, which is bounded by economy. There's a lot that we could do as scientists and technologists, as teachers, as educators, as human beings. But there's just not enough money in the global economy to do it. But computation is one of those things that has been falling exponentially fast in price. I hold in my pocket, hopefully on silent, something that 20 years ago would have been near supercomputer performance. We all now are used to having a supercomputer in our pockets, which gives us access to a world of information which is bigger than the theoretical capacity of the human brain and growing itself at an exponential rate. Data is very, very large indeed, and processing it is becoming cheaper and cheaper and more and more capable. So that's item number one. I think it's worth now taking a little bit of a dive to talk about what machine learning is and maybe, by example, talk about what it isn't. The first thing we need is a computer. Well, of course, these have been around for a very long time. The word computer quite literally originally meant, in the days of Babbage in the mid-19th century, a person who computes, somebody who was good at tabulating. And Babbage's computing machines were there to replace the drudgery of human computation. Probably not a bad idea, anybody who's tried to go through their own self-assessment, tax return, and so on. This is, of course, the analytical engine from the mid-19th century. There is fundamentally nothing there that we don't see in a modern computer. The one that these slides are on, the one in my pocket, and so on. It consists of a way in which we can program it, and the programming was, in essence, the idea that broke 
the computer from being something that went through rote computation. So I take my first uh, point to say an algorithm is a fixed sequence of steps which we take, typically mathematically in a computer, but could be almost anything, it's a recipe, which if we follow it, we go from A to B in a prescribed way, conditioned on the things that we observe. So one point that I would make is that algorithms that learn are no longer algorithms. Okay, I agree with Simon. Algorithms can't do what we do. But algorithms that learn aren't algorithms in the more traditional sense. And therefore, I believe they can do all that we do and more. My hero, Ada Lovelace. Um, who else gets to have a computer language named after them? And one of the first people who realised that programmes can work upon themselves. I think that that is worth taking a pause. So algorithm comes from algorithmus, the Arab who said we can follow a procedure to perform a task. What Ada Lovelace said is that algorithm can operate on itself. It is self-referential and it can modify on the basis of what it has done and what it has seen. It can modify the way it operates in the future. That, I think, was a pivotal moment in technological history. It's a point where algorithms become self-aware in the lightest possible sense. That means that we move from having algorithms which are on the left, written by, say, me, to say, this is how you perform a particular task. The sorting task is much beloved of interview questions, not just in IQ tests, but thinking about it's theoretical. There are very efficient algorithms for sorting things. And, you know, sorting a list is order n log n. If there's n items, it costs n times the logarithm of n in terms of computational time, and you can't really do any better than that. Algorithms, we can write that do that. Algorithms of the second kind, however, learn from data, and the only thing that we give them is prior knowledge about the mathematics of what learning actually is. They will learn to create, for example, an algorithm which optimally solves a sorting problem of numbers or alphabetic lists and so on. We don't have to tell them the best way of doing it. They learn from example. And I think there are more ways than one in which these mimic so many facets of what we see in our own learning capabilities, but also those of all other living creatures as well. And by and large, most AI is about having data where we can observe something in the world around us and we need to work out what to do with that. In this case, these are some digits which we've asked the computer to try and work out what the answer should be. You give it something and say, what is that digit? It looks at it and it has to convert a series of slightly fluffy grey pixels on the screen into a category with a degree of belief. And that degree of belief is actually essential. Because I think if we think of algorithms and learning machines as somehow auton uh, automatically just providing an answer, we miss one of the fundamental points. That the answer oftentimes is less important than calibrating your sense of ignorance. So in this case, this could be maybe a seven, more likely a two, even as a human being, we maybe would say, can I look at a few other examples that have been written by this person before we make a judgment? These AI algorithms say exactly the same thing. So another mini message is that AI is not about answers. It's about quantifying degrees of belief that a machine has over available actions, answers, or opportunities. And that degree of belief 
is absolutely vital to get it to operate in a dynamic, uncertain world, which, again, I'm sure we would all agree is what the real world is like. And this notion of probability theory has rich underpinnings in logic and extended logic, which is all to do with the ways in which we invert deductive logic. We may observe that if we walk down the street and it is raining, that when we look up, there are clouds in the sky. And I know that there will be meteorological phenomena for which that won't always be true. Almost always it is. We learn then that as we walk down the street and ask ourselves, should I take an umbrella? I see that it is cloudy and I'm more likely to believe that it will rain and therefore I take an umbrella. That is a degree of belief. There is a consequence of staying dry or getting wet and I choose the action which gives me the best outcome. And I will choose that on the basis of some degree of belief. If my umbrella is a long way away and I don't think it's going to rain much, I probably am not going to get it. So it isn't just a binary. These things are soft decisions. And learning in its essence, as I'll hopefully show to you, is about reducing the ignorance that you have over the things that you care about or the things you are told to care about. And these degrees of belief can be held by any agent. And I use agent in the broadest possible sense, something that has agency in the world. It can act and there are consequences to its actions. That can be a robot, that can be me, that can be you, that can be an animal, and so on. So, I mentioned a little bit about uncertainty. Mathematically, uncertainty is defined by a quantity which we refer to as entropy. It comes from 19th century thermodynamics, and it is the disorder. It is loosely related to things like heat. Molecules all disordered, bobbling around, and I have to do work on a system in order to reduce that disorder. I do work in a refrigerator to cool things down, in other words, reduce that disorder. And learning is fundamentally like a big fridge. I do work on a system in order to cool that system so that I have much more contained disorder. And the ultimate, I would like to cool it to a point where I have order. So there's a couple of funny stories. I first came across this. Uh, child of the 70s, <laughs> or child of the 60s, and watching Doctor Who in the 70s, the entropy lords who go around the universe trying to stop the heat death of the universe by reducing entropy and allowing it to expand. But very importantly, um, on these notions of uh, entropy, it can be applied to an abstract process as well such as a degree of ignorance. It doesn't have to be a physical quantity that has disorder. Simply saying, uh, what am I going to have for dinner tonight? Um, I simply don't know. Um, don't know at this point. <coughs> so I have degrees of belief which are maximally disordered. I have a probability over actions and outcomes which is as flat as possible. Now, if you bear with me, that turns out to be a great place to start because that is an unbiased initiation. You go into the world with a prior that is unbiased. And we start out by imagining that we have a world where grey is my disorder. And I observe possible wobbly lines in that world. And my goal is to try and learn some curve which may be of importance to me. I could be navigating somewhere. I could be forecasting the weather tomorrow or the stock market in a week's time. But before I've seen anything, my degree of ignorance is maximal. And there are many possible curves that I can draw from my mind's eye. And I choose that phrase very carefully because that's exactly what these algorithms are doing. They are postulating hypothetical futures that might happen hypothetical paths that take me from A to B and assessing their consequences. We then observe some data and it says the real world isn't grey and fuzzy at these regions, it's actually much more constrained. 
and we do the mathematics and we have learned. And you note at those points where we observe something real, assuming it isn't fake news, of course, where we've observed something real, we've pinned it down, our uncertainty has shrunk. But in other regions, we are still uncertain. Now, iteratively, if it costs me to learn something else from my data, I am going to want to learn in the right places. So if I can pay you, but I get to choose what I observe next, these are great places to gather knowledge. Because the goal of this knowledge gathering is to learn as much as possible about the world around me. I start with ignorance, I observe some things, I build what we call a surrogate function which encapsulates my beliefs and my uncertainties associated with those beliefs. And I use that in order to request where I'd like to see the world next. Sounds a bit like science. I observe a bit, I come up with a theory, and I then propose experiments in order to test or disprove my theory. And indeed, what I've just described is the essence of the optimal way in which we mathematically can learn most in any given circumstance. If you go in with bias, you learn less. Okay? I'm sure you've all, uh, you all know this. Uh, guess a number. I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 100. What's the best first guess if I have truthfully will tell you whether you're too high or too low? Best first guess is always 50. Because you go in because the probability that I say too high is the same as the probability of saying too low. Maximise your disorder before you observe the world is the recipe to squeeze as much as possible from the world. And it's as good for us as it is for a machine. The other point that this really makes is that as we begin to observe the world as it streams past us, and we are asked what might happen next, we can postulate a range of possibilities. If I say, I think that that will happen next most likely, and what the world throws at me is really the black swan event. Either there's a measurement error. I think most scientists would like to believe that it was a measurement error, not their theory, of course. Or I need to adjust the way in which I think about the world around me. So this principle gives me a, a methodology which is mathematically optimal for learning in the presence of dynamism, concept drift and uncertainty. Do we do it? We sure do. Pretty much all studies that have, been, uh, that have been done on us as human beings shows two things. If degrees of belief are kept moderate, as in they're not too tiny or not absolutely certain, we follow pretty much exactly what we would expect. We are, we are children bound by the optimality of mathematics. Life has had a very long time to evolve to get this right. And this is about decision making. And if you make bad decisions in the presence of uncertain information, populations that make better decisions will tend to survive. So we are pretty darned good at this kind of reasoning. Everything we do can be couched in these principles. The only difference being is that we are notoriously poor at dealing with very small probabilities and sometimes very large ones. Anybody who's been on a survival course will know there is a big difference between real risk and apparent risk. Real risk, that slope looks lovely to ski down. There is a real risk if you're off piste. Apparent risk, at certain times of year, that same slope may look icy and I really don't want to ski down it. But the avalanche risk is much lower. Chance I'll break a leg may be higher, but that I get killed is much less. We're not terribly good at balancing real and apparent risk, but that's a completely different story. So this whole notion of learning is really, I would like you to think of it as designing optimal experiments. And we as human beings and all learning organisms 
tests that have been done on everything from fruit flies to primates and us show that we as a species learn in fundamentally similar ways to our algorithms. That's great because optimality is just that. Given the same information again, if I played any other strategy, in the long run I lose. So we tend to play the winning strategy. We observe things that we know. We build surrogates. These are things that are inside our heads or inside our machines. And these are models from which we can draw possible futures or possible consequences of actions that we are yet to take. That helps us to select the actions we actually do want to take. Because we've run through in our mind's eye, or in the machine mind's eye, the right thing to do. And we choose the experiments that maximise some value function that we've been told that it is our goal to maximise. We run the experiments, we observe, and so the loop continues. In my mind, this is learning at its coarsest possible level. It is optimal. We can do it with a machine. And pretty much it's exactly how all these AI algorithms are operating. So, intelligence in an agent is tantamount to following the scientific process. Machines, at their very core, when they learn, are doing science. It allows principle, it's coherent, long run it's optimal in every possible sense. There is no other strategy that will give us as much reward as following this. <coughs> whether we play games or whether we are acting professionally or simply learning how to perform a task. So, let's have a look at this operating. This is generation zero of something that looks adorably like a puppy. There will be a picture of a real puppy later. And you can see it's effectively just trying things out. It's experimenting, going, I think if I do this, I might get better. It slowly, slowly is getting a tiny bit better. We have to wait quite a lot. <laughs> and now it trots along in a very happy way. Nobody taught this robot how to walk. It worked it out by itself. It worked it out simply by being told that to put distance between you and where you started is the thing that I would like you to do. And it worked it all out. And it did it in a very efficient way by, to begin with, pretty much trial and error, because that's how we all do things when we learn to ride a bike. We fall off. We get hit. There isn't much value and lots of pain. Slowly, we pick up tricks that keep us on that bike for longer, and that's exactly what these algorithms are doing. So, machine mind kind of formal takeaway number one. Learning needs data. Learning is the reduction of uncertainty, and I would just say in brackets, of the things we care about. Yeah? You can reduce the uncertainty in things you don't care about, but that isn't actually helping you to make consequences of you acting in the world better for you as a learning agent. We can choose intelligently what to see, and learning at its very nature is driven by surprise. If we have monotone learning, monotone goals, we all get very good at doing one thing, but it's extremely dull, and we actually stop learning. And that is driving along a straight road as fast as we can. That is the drag strip. And we need to move and find diversity. So just echoing some of the things Simon spoke about, I think of steering as finding paths that promote diversity in a principled, coherent way. However, Professor Snape, <laughs> the alchemy of machine learning, our Professor of Potions, machines and people are very, very good at finding patterns where none exist. We need to look at the, light, the night sky and see Aquarius, Pisces, and they're just stars. Yeah, they're going to look different in a few million years. They're not, it's not really out there. It's just lovely to be able to say it's a 
from the constellation of Perseus there will be micrometeorites and you'll see shooting stars and so on. They don't really exist. This is an obvious example, but it's often less obvious when we find patterns in data, even as human beings, but moreover as machines. Some of my favourites come in um, the finance world, uh, which is a big part of what I do. My favourite of that is uh, the vomiting camel pattern. <laughs> if we find gold rising up and down in price, it will vomit down. <laughs> <laughs> and that's an explanation. Most patterns explain what we have just seen in an attempt to rationalise what we've seen. None of these patterns are predictive. Remember, science is about postulating degrees of belief about how the world might be and testing them to see if you can forecast out of sample. Simply being able to do something again that you've been taught how to do is not learning. Being able to extrapolate and transfer your skills to a subtly different situation is the kind of outcome that we would like from learning, especially in a machine. The problem is we just are filled with a world of data and there will be spurious correlations. Again, some of my favourites. This is the Strong correlation between computer science doctorates and total revenue in games arcades in the US. I think this isn't spurious. This is probably quite true. Other ones? Uh, the amount of margarine consumed and the divorce rate in the state of Maine. I don't think anybody here from Maine, anyway. We, we only have butter in our house. Just in case. These are, these are laughable, and there's a whole website, Spurious Correlations, that's great fun, and it goes through, you know, this, that, and the other, and shows that So apparent relationship doesn't mean causation. The great statistician Fisher pointed this out, that the decline in the birth rate in early 20th century Britain was strongly correlated with the decline in the stork population. <laughs> the hidden variable is urbanisation. We have less children in an urban environment, and storks just don't live in an urban environment. So urbanisation Im impacts both, and there are many other examples. So we have to think carefully about these hidden variables. Let me give you a little test, which is quite easy compared to some of Simon's. <laughs> These, I think, we can... There are puppies, you see. There have got to be dogs in every talk. Um, these are dogs. These are... And I quite like wolves. These are wolves. So here is the test. What is this? How many people think that's a wolf, given the pictures of wolves and dogs that they've seen? Anybody think it's a wolf? Uh, maybe one person. It is, well, it is. It is a dog, factually, but my algorithm will say it's a wolf. No, really. Why is that? No. Yeah. 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 So, if what I give are pictures of dogs in environments that have no snow, and I give pictures of wolves, which tend to be photographed beautifully and photogenically in their snowy environment, the moment we see a puppy in the snow, mm. yeah, so... Take home message. Algorithms are good at finding statistically significant but potentially ridiculous patterns that apparently solve our problem. This isn't just made up. This is a, a real example of being able to distinguish different species of dogs and wolves and so on. If we make this mistake, the algorithm rather sensibly is going to find a loophole. And that loophole is it just needs to look and see whether there's snow there. And if there is, it's a wolf. Because that is everything that it's been told thus far. Again, we need to be super careful about hidden bias in all the data that we present to our machines. As we need to be to our young people, of course, as well. Algorithms, though, even if they are biased and erroneous as we could argue this wolf in the snow, is just not. The algorithm apparently, we're told, 
on the data that it's seen thus far is 100% accurate, and therefore we should trust it. Dogs and wolves doesn't matter. Maybe this was a mortgage application, or a child wanting to get into a school. Do we let loose algorithms that have 100% accuracy thus far? They might not be looking at the right thing. So in my humble opinion, it does matter, and it begins to take us into the world of ethics and why these things matter to us as human beings when we can't necessarily understand how the algorithms are working. Jeff Hinton, who's just won the Turing Award, the Nobel Prize in Computer Science, in effect, this year, said a couple of years ago a very true thing. A real intelligence doesn't break when you slightly change the problem. I did just that with my puppy in the snow. Real intelligence can distill the right thing from the data. Now, we are pretty good visually at doing that. Orally, listening to things, we're actually not terribly good. There are lots of things we get wrong when we listen to things, but we're pretty darn good when it comes to vision. Tactile, again, we're not terribly good at doing this. So it all depends how we observe this information as human beings. Here's one of my other favourite examples. You can download a sticker which you put next to any object and it's and algorithms say that always it's a toaster that you're looking at. And these are real algorithms where you can download and it's an AI engine that's produced after months and months of training and years of work by the smartest people on the planet. And we put it next to a banana and it says it's a toaster. Um, I'm slightly concerned that there is a finite probability here. That this is a slug. <laughs> Algorithms do things in ways that are different to us. The Stanford AI review in 2017, we're flying blind in our conversations to do with decision-making in AI. Yeah, I think I would wholeheartedly agree with that. Companies are on the hook if the hiring algorithms are biased. How could that be? Well, the data's biased. Self-driving car. It's going to happen, but it doesn't mix well with cars. Every time we take the controls of something, we kill and maim. And I don't say that just for effect. That's the statistics. We're terrible. But algorithms are accountable in much stronger ways than maybe we necessarily are. And I think they rightly, if they're going to replace us, they've really got to be a lot better than us. Fortunately, these kind of things self-driving cars and autonomous lane guidance and so on are getting better and better. And yes, if we could move to an environment where your taxi that you call to come to a place from the station is an autonomous vehicle and there aren't people driving cars on the road, they will be much, much safer. But people and machines don't mix in these free-ranging environments. Machines solve problems in ways that people can't preempt. We're not sure how they work. And to successfully merge the two, we need to be able to get into the mind of a machine. And that we are almost always unable to do. They can be quite useful. There was a very interesting paper that came out of MIT Media Lab that was looking at bias I think debiasing our algorithms can go some way to help debiasing many of the preconceptions that we hold in society. We, not very long ago, would have done a web search on scientists and we would have found mainly dead, mainly white, mainly male. Now, we have much more diversity. It's slightly frightening we see Donald <laughs> Trump here. <laughs> So, algorithms can be fragile. So can we. Algorithms can be spoofed. So can we. Algorithms can be dangerous. My, oh, my. So can we. And algorithms can be biased. My, oh, my, oh, my. So can we. Yeah. Learning comes at these prices. You can't get round it. The trick is to work out where, as a society, the balance is between these things. If we want things that work better, 
and augment what we can do as human beings, and we bring this technology into our lives, we're going to have to put up with some of the inevitable bad things. We've put up with that from people for a very long time. We bring democratically elected leaders into our lives. They can't make a decision. Okay. So, how is this going to affect employment? There was a very influential paper written by uh, a very good friend of mine, uh, Mike Osborne and Carl Frey here in Oxford. And they were looking at sector by sector the likely impact of AI and automation on the job market and showing that some sectors are going to be decimated. It is happening across the world. And Sergey Brin and Google, what about fairness? How might they manipulate people? Are they safe? I think it's very important that everybody, not just people high up in world organisations, ask these questions of all the algorithms that we use pretty much on a daily basis. Some people are pretty negative. This is Andrew Yang, who uh, this year, I believe, has withdrawn his candidacy for the Democrats. Um, but he said, all you need is self-driving cars to destabilise society. I think that was a little bit of a polemic, but I take the spirit of what he's saying. All you need are algorithms that are unaccountable and unexplainable to destabilise what we are as a society. Again, this isn't about driving. It's about me not getting a mortgage or not having credit or my children not going to a school or not being able to do X and so on. So it goes to the core of the way we act in a society that's increasingly automated. Having said that, if we get it right, algorithms can forecast, they can model the future in ways that we can't. They're extraordinarily good at asking what if. They can quantify the risk associated with those what if actions. What if I did this? Well, that's not a good idea. And they're very honest about, they're calibrated when they measure risk, something that we're not. Oh, I can drive at 100 miles an hour down a 30 zone. I'm 18 and I'm a good driver, that's fine. Algorithms don't do that kind of thing. They can deal rationally with uncertainty and partial observations in a way that we are not particularly good at. We're just not built. We hit sensory overload and we are built to throttle information, as Simon rightly said. Most of what we see is kind of made up on the fly. With enough training, these algorithms can do things that we think of as absolutely human. And I think that's pretty exciting, so long as we make sure we understand how this, these things are going to be operating, because they will operate at scales beyond human. We can't go in and say, why did you make that decision? Well, here are the five trillion data points that I assessed. If you'd care to look through them individually and write a, a, a report on each one, I will tell you why I came to that. You just can't have that. So we need to be confident in understanding how these machines operate. And they can operate for a lot of good things. The world is awash with data, be it scientific information about plastics in oceans, be it information taken glean by scraping social media and looking for waste plastic on beaches, which people don't want to do, but algorithms are great at looking at pictures of beaches 24-7. We get knowledge, and that helps us as human beings make better informed decisions. I'm sure one day I'll be proved wrong, but everybody I've ever met, when given the truth and faced with information, they try their utmost to make the right decision at the right time based on those facts. And we as human beings just don't have enough facts to make many of the big decisions. And therefore, algorithms are a way of distilling the ocean of data into the plastic flotsam of fact and helping us to understand what we might need to do. How do we end world hunger? How do we change the way in which disease spreads globally? How do we feed 10 billion people? How do we combat climate change and yet still not give up much of our lifestyle these are big, deep questions that we as human beings don't really have the answers to, but most importantly, we actually don't have all the data. And we can't run through all the consequences. 
And of course, this absolutely comes to a fore when we ask these algorithms to do things that we think of as strategic and genius in a narrow, genius way, such as classic things like AlphaGo. I didn't think that I would live in a world where every game has a machine that is the world champion, every game of note. Three hours, and it's doing the same thing. It's going through this active experimental design. What do I want to know now? Oh, I'll play that, because if I fail, I'll learn something anyway. Not worried about failure. Should have said that earlier. If you only judge by success, yeah, when you go into something you don't know what to do, you should be prepared in every experiment as a scientist for 50% of your efforts to fail. Funding bodies don't like that. If you bias it so that you do something that is more likely to succeed, you are no longer doing science. I fear we teach our young people in a slightly different way. We teach them to help them succeed, not necessarily to fail half the time, but they need to fail to learn. Something again that Simon picked up on. AlphaGo, of course, has none of these hang-ups, and after 70 hours, it's playing at superhuman level. There will never be a human being that will beat it, vanishing the small probability. It surpassed anything. And of course, there's some wonderful examples of this. This isn't a person in a suit. This is a robot that's learned how to jump on things and do this and that. It's doing a bit of parkour. That's fantastic. Now, give us a finale and take a bow. Isn't that fantastic? I didn't think a decade ago that I would be seeing this being learned. Again, how did it learn? Well, <laughs> it learned much more like this. How do I put a box on something? Uh, this is the kind of epic fail. But again, for every success where we take a bow, <laughs> we have to lie on the floor in failure. And that is the way in which we learn. So let me begin to wrap up and talk a little bit about my own views about where we're heading. Machine learning is replacing human work. We'd be fools not to acknowledge that. Technology has always been replacing us for good or for bad. There have always been social upheavals associated with that. There have been people who embrace it and those who understandably um, are unhappy with that replacement. It's transformed manufacturing. We could argue on a planetary scale that's not a very good thing. We have access to pretty much cheap goods from almost everywhere. My car should not be as cheap as it is. Plastic things shouldn't be. You know, these are all technological advances that make it very cheap for things to be made, handcrafted by an artisan out of wood from a fallen tree is a lot more expensive. Robots. Machine vision. Apart from wolves and dogs in the snow, they're so much better than we are. How's that useful? Well, uh, let's say... On a media level, we want to annotate the back catalogue of millions of hours of TV in the BBC. We're not going to have people doing it, so algorithms do it. So if I want to pick up a still of Logopolis of Doctor Who from the 1970s, I can just do a search. Kind of useful for me giving the talk. But on a much more profound level, these will annotate histological slices... They will look at uh, spread of pollution, deforestation, mudslides, fault lines, forest fires. Anything that we can observe, algorithms are better at doing focal tasks. So they are brilliant in narrow regimes where they know clearly what the outcome should be. And we are careful not to have a puppy in the snow. Human-machine interaction. A few years ago, talking to your phone and people would have given you a funny look if they realised there wasn't somebody at the other end of the phone. Now it is commonplace. It works. And we can laugh about the times it kind of doesn't work. 
but we laugh because that is in the minority now. We can lip read, we can translate. No, it's not terribly good, but it's more than good enough to, you know, order a cheese omelette in a language that you don't speak. And that's a great thing because that's technology building bonds with other human beings. But on a, on a profound level, it is changing the smallness of the world. Languages really are no longer. Most social media, most emails that we get, it will say, this was written to you in... I work a lot with people in, say, Norway. This was written in Norwegian. Would you like me to translate? Yep. Great. Now I know when you're coming and what you're saying. Okay. Automating paralegal, contract law and patent law. Two years ago was the first time that a case constructed by an algorithm that looked through precedent cases and constructed facts and arguments for a lawyer went to court and won. So, big changes taking place. Accounting and auditing have always been things since the 19th century where people used mechanics or mechanical computing in order to make their lives easier. This is tabulating on steroids, but it is something that is happening all the time. These are constrained, rule-based, and so machines are extremely good at it. Most logistics tasks whether it's ordering things in stores, fully automated mines. Uh, in Australia, mines where equipment knows when it's going to go faulty and drives itself to the warehouse so it can be maintained. Oh, I'm feeling a bit belt number two needs tightening. And technicians do it and off it goes. And there's no driver. This is a contained environment. There's no pedestrians. There's no other vehicles. So it can work. Again, same thing can happen. So you begin to have uh, devices that do portering in hospitals, take notes from one place to another, and so on. I think these augment what we are as human beings. They take away something that otherwise is actually not a particularly skilled task that a person is doing, but is something that uh, maybe we want to replace. But if you are that person and it's your job, this is a replacement. The rise of autonomy... I think this is always divisive. Uh, we need to get used to it. It is going to happen at some point. Economically, technically, politically and socially, there are so many positive benefits to having our infrastructure coordinated in a much better way. And I know the Swiss and the Germans can do it with people in the cars and the trains, um, but most people can't. So we need, we need algorithms to do this. And algorithms that work on themselves... So algorithms which faced with a particular task look over the, over the, the space of all other learning algorithms to say, do you really need industrial strength AI to solve this? I think you might get away with this. I actually think this is pretty exciting. In fact, so much I've devoted many years of my academic career to this. The reason being is if you can give somebody the Occam's razor of algorithms... That algorithm solves your job. It does what you want it to do, minimises bad consequences and so on. And yet it is, by definition, the simplest algorithm that will solve your task to within the constraints that you as a designer or, or client requires. That's good, because the simpler those algorithms are, the more likely you and I are at understanding how they work, but more importantly, how they might go wrong and understanding how gracefully or otherwise they might decay into wrongness. And we don't want fragile algorithms, as Jeff Hinton famously said a few years ago, that completely break when you change the problem slightly. And simple algorithms are more resilient to small changes having a profound effect. Keep it simple, stupid. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, is a very big area. So... Machines can drive, serve customers, distill knowledge. What are humans still good for? Well, we are still at the forefront of creativity, though recent work in the last couple of years with computer music and computer art, where you show an algorithm Rembrandt portraits or Turner seascapes, and it simply produces from its mind's eye a hallucinated Turner that never existed, 
that looks so like the real deal. It is not a copy, but it is in the style of. This has really taken off, and I would argue that is, a, that is creative. And so um, I think we are at risk of not even being the dominant creative species on the planet uh, very soon. Social intelligence, thank goodness there's one thing I can give you some good news about. Games, go, chess, one-on-one. -on -one. We're never going to beat algorithms. Where do we do very well? Actually, games that you might not think of. Poker, multiplayer games, where if anybody's got teenage kids, where they sit in their room playing with XXX, somebody who could be anywhere in the world, but there may be 30 of them working together to do whatever. Cooperative games, or indeed mass competitive games, are computationally still prohibitive. We take a lot of shortcuts, but kind of, we are bred into this world where we're playing a game with other human beings every day of our lives. Social interaction. And that puts us absolutely above algorithms in these kind of environments. So there is one thing that we're good at. Having said that, I'm a scientist. Automated systems can review a lot more than I can. They can extract meanings. They can, take, they can postulate laws of physics from data in a way that our famous scientists have done. But they can explain and give conservation principles and discover things from the new wealth of data we have at rates and scales that I could only ever dream of. So I'm afraid, despite machine intelligence being narrow, lacking empathy, frequently biased and prone to failure, it does manage to outperform us at so many tasks. And I would point out in a gentle way that we are prone to all of the above as well. Open for discussion. The era of human intelligence is right now ending and the era of the algorithm has begun. A few thanks, but if that's a gloomy picture, let me leave you with this cartoon, which is about the danger of relying on data from the past that was surprisingly easy. How come the robotic uprising used spears and rocks instead of missiles and lasers? If you look to historical data, the vast majority of battle winners used pre-modern weaponry. So I will end there. Thank you very much indeed. to be able to catch the dice to ask a question. Um, when you used the word uncertainty, could, could you explain to Stephen what you mean by it? Um, and I have in mind Keynes's distinction between risk and uncertainty. Risk is what we can give a probability to. Uncertainty is what we can't even give a probability to. I'm struggling to understand how AI can deal right. with situations in which no probabilities can be attached to outcomes. Um, you can always attach a probability to an outcome. Um, that's you know the, the, the tenet of Bayesian probability theory. And I use uncertainty here in, this, in the narrow mathematical sense that describes a degree of ignorance associated with a problem. How we measure uncertainty is always, again, mathematically, uniquely defined using this concept of entropy. But it may manifest itself in slightly different ways depending upon what we're trying to do. So if I'm trying to predict the amount of rainfall this summer in the UK, I may give you a number which may be in millimetres of rain per day or month. That, um, that will be uncertain, and that uncertainty may manifest itself as an error bar, some credibility interval, which describes my degree of belief that I may not be right perfectly, but I will be probably correct 95% belief within an interval. If I'm dealing with, is it a dog or a wolf, 
the degree of uncertainty is how far away from probability one and probability zero I am. So if I said it's likely a wolf with probability 0.55 and it's a dog 0.45, I still err on the wolf side. That's rather different in terms of me stating my confidence to me saying probability one, it's a wolf, or probability 0.9. So I use the narrow mathematical definition. That's helpful because the mathematics of learning go hand in hand with the mathematics of uncertainty. I haven't spoken about aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty. These are uh, uncertainties to do with noise of the world, external exogenous information which itself is uncertain or obscured to us, we simply don't have enough data to compute. Or we have internal uncertainty, in particular because we've chosen to use a model which is over complex to solve our problem. So if you give me 10 pieces of knowledge and I have a model with a million degrees of freedom that I need to somehow set tuning knobs in my model, my engine, I'm going to do a very poor job at tuning my model because you have not given me much data. And that means that my internal ignorance is really rather high. Comes back to Occam's razor. How do we achieve good performance with high certainty, internal uncertainty? Choose the simplest model that explains the world around us. Otherwise, you escalate ignorance. I hope that gave some. Sorry the answer's so long. I should be better at giving crisp answers. I'm sorry to ask a second question, but I would love to know, as someone, as so many of us are so interested in learning, also from a psychotherapeutic as well as a behaviourist dimension, is it in your mind that at some point machines will develop their own unconscious subliminal thinking, or is that what they're doing when we don't know what they're doing? Ah. Uh. So in a very narrow, sort of pedantic sense, I suppose, I'm not terribly sure what subconscious really means, even as a human being. Um, machines do form internal representations, which unless we pull them apart, component by component, we don't ever get to see, because they're part of the internal machinery, the cogs inside. Those internal representations are oftentimes incredibly informative if we're prepared to look at how they're set. They often tell us more insight about how a machine is solving a problem than the answer that comes out the back end. And if we mean by subconscious, the internal workings which are not visible at input or output of a pipe of reasoning, then machines already have a subconscious in the loosest possible sense. Um, Jed, just you started saying you loved your time at school and you learned a huge amount. So, um, just a much more sort of general sort of question: What do you know now that you think you should have been taught at school? Um, Can I just hold that? It's a great oh. question. <laughs> it's, it's also the question, more or less, that uh, Claire is going to ask uh, our panelists when we have the panel. But is, is that okay? Which is going to be very focused on what school needs to be doing. Um, uh, the fact it hasn't been doing anything in the past. Jack, can I ask you this question differently? If you're, if you're a child today, yes. at school, should you be, um, uh, 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 would you be happy about the future? Or do you think you, if you're glad you're your age you are now, or would you only be 11? Uh, there, were, there were many unhappy children when I was 11, and there are many happy children, I'm sure, of age 11 now, as there were happy children then and unhappy ones now. So I, I think it's, it's very difficult to describe. I, I would just say um, the only advice that I would give would be the narrowness of a subject that you excel at doesn't really matter in life. Yeah? Learning and enjoying the process of not being the smartest in the room and learning from everybody around you is a joy and everybody has something they can teach you. And I think that that's uh, you know, my personal belief about where happiness through life comes from. Very personal belief, though. 
I'm just going to step in, uh, because I'm not on the panel, but I do want to make a connection and perhaps to link up bits of the talks that we've heard. Social consciousness. And Stephen was talking about that as one of the kind of the last bastions machines find difficult to do. And why is that? Um, well, take yourself back to that mental exercise that we did, that associative steering exercise, that relied upon um, the imagining yourself and then imagining others. And that other is infinitely flexible any person, any community, anything that is going on. And our social awareness relies on that ability to be participate in a community of minds. Because what you're doing is imagining someone else's mind. We don't know how we do that uh, biologically. We're not clear on how we are able to, first of all, form a self-representation, then form a representation of what you might be and then step into your shoes and what we are thinking. But that's what enables us to feel the world and form conclusions from it um, as a social population. And it's what, what's enabled us as a species to form these incredibly elaborate, sophisticated, flexible social populations that I know other species have. And I, I think it's important to, to, to kind of recognize that machines would need to form their own community social machines talking to each other, have that kind of consciousness, whether they can ever share that with, with us as human beings and us, um, it, it is perhaps another kind of matter, but um, there's a connection uh, cognitively with um, perhaps what, uh, what, what Steve was saying, what I was saying. Uh, and remember what John was saying, that uh, I talked about the integration, the formation of self-representation being a mixture of both the conscious and unconscious, and we saw it in all kinds of different regions. Um, so, uh, complex cognition. We've got time for, for one more question. What if I'm allowed to ask a question? I have a, I agree with much of what you say and disagree with much of what you say. It doesn't surprise you, I'm sure. But one of the limitations I feel is, is more important um, than perhaps comes across in, in what you're saying is the fact that machine learning algorithms cannot explain the way that they reach decisions. It is that. It's a bit like when you're teaching a child. You actually want to know what's going on inside mm -hmm. in order to help them. And so is it not that limitation in the way that machine learning algorithms can give us some understanding of that internal working that we need to concern ourselves with more? Um, I, I entirely agree. There's a lot of effort trying to break open the algorithm and understand its inner workings. I personally don't think that we understand either how others of our own species come to a decision or in many cases how we even come to a decision. Uh, we're not transparent even about our own selves. Um, but it is right and proper that we now set the rules of the game so we can choose to have the algorithms that augment our society to be open and transparent, and we can check that they are not unconsciously biased with a big B and a small U. I mean, it's one of the ways that we um, not only learn by becoming aware of how we've learned, and, and we know that that's another connection from this morning, but it's also how we safeguard and um, supervise and then uh, hold people to account for that. You can trace back the steps they took to arrive at something. So if we can't do this with machines, then there are arguably go huge governance issues. And um, uh, I think it's one of the interesting things about Stephen's work is to try to simplify algorithms, which can then be more explicable rather than the hidden black boxes. Now, interestingly, um, this isn't to curtail this Q&A, but it's to um, anticipate the panel. But interesting, the last question was for posed by Professor Rose Luckin, who's joined us today. If we had a longer day or another conference, Rose would have been one of the speakers today. She is uh, a leading uh, expert in education technology and the relationship between AI and machine learning in the country. We just recently released um, a, a book, Machine Learning and Human Intelligence, on the faculty at UCL. We're very privileged to have Rose joining us just for the panel uh, today.